Ah uh, yes, we are live now. Please. All right. So, uh, shall I just go ahead and start off with the questions from the doc file? Yeah, please, Anna. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for all the questions. I'm going to go sequentially, and I'm going to have to read out the questions to answer them. So let me just do that, and um, then we'll take any other questions that people may have. Uh, so I am going to get directly to the question. So question one said, uh, says, um, I, it will be helpful if you can share some good study material for, for the learning RE anatomy. Uh, I would recommend any good uh, book on comparative anatomy, like comparative anatomy of the vertebrates by Canton Carr, uh, vertebrate zoology by Cardong, um, and of course, the handbook of bird biology, which is published by Cornell, all of which should give you a lot of the information that you need. Uh, the second question is, can you tell me the proportionality between SA to surface area and volume ratio versus temperature of body and heat produced by the body of birds? I don't think there's a proportionality between uh, surface area to volume ratio and the temperature of the body. Uh, as far as heat produced by the body of birds, as I mentioned in my lecture, if you have a higher uh, surface area to volume ratio, you lose heat faster because you have more exposed area. And so you have to produce more heat to compensate for it. That is not just true of birds, it is true of organisms in general, and also any body, whether animate or inanimate, that is a conductor of heat. It could be true of cubes of different sizes as well. Um, it is a very simple physics principle, basically, and it, the same rule applies to the food that you heat on a stovetop. So it's, uh, it's really not something that's bird specific. Uh, the third question uh, is- Sorry. Um... Are you able to, by any chance, switch on your video? I think uh, oh. uh, if it's possible, then that'd be great. If not, My that's bad. fine. I have video, but I'm wearing a mask. So everyone's going to have to see me wearing a mask. I'm in the lab. No, that's <laughs> fine. I think it's just nice to, yeah, yeah, if possible. Yeah, I will. As long as my, uh, I'm, I'm here. As long as my battery doesn't start running out, I'm good. But at least for now, I can keep my video on. Sorry, okay. I completely forgot about that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Considering that most birds have high metabolism, does it have an impact on their lifespan? Yes, it does. Uh, for instance, does hummingbirds have a shorter lifespan as opposed to birds adopting to torpor? Yes, physiologically, yes, but there's something wrong about this question because hummingbirds actually adopt to torpor themselves. So uh, the question is actually incorrect in that sense. But yes, birds with higher metabolism, metabolic rates generally have shorter lifespans. Do birds with higher metabolism consume food of a higher calorific value? Yes, they do. Are they sensitive to minute changes in the environment, specifically affecting their food sources? Yes, they are. Uh, that could make them fragile from a survival point of view. I might not use the word fragile um, because fragility is a human concept. And what we see as fragile may be a well, well adapted to a certain set of environmental conditions. I might go with specialized, if I were you. Would like to hear viewpoints from Dr. Suhail and Dr. Raja as well, if any. Uh, Suhail, do you want to add anything to that before I go on? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number four, could you please explain the bird respiratory system with the help of a schematic diagram? Uh, as of now, no, I cannot, but I'll, uh, I'll tell you the simple idea that if you have trains going along a linear track on a 30 minute cycle, so imagine the first train gets in and it, go, it can go halfway down the track in 30 minutes and it waits. And then the second cycle begins and a second train comes behind it and the first train exits. Second train goes and sits halfway through the cycle and then exits. So each, each train is a breath of air and it takes two full cycles to exit the track or the respiratory system in this case. And that's how it works. If you actually want a diagram of how the bird respiratory system works, uh, Google is as good of a source as any to give you that. And I would recommend doing that. Question number five, could you please elaborate on the term surface area to volume ratio? Well, I don't know how much more I can elaborate on it. Uh, it is the ratio of an organism's surface area to an organism's volume. And that, uh, that is uh, really as much as I can say. What is surface area? It is the total area covered by all your exposed surface. What is your volume? It is the, if you are hollow, it is the volume of liquid that can fill up inside you. So that's surface area to volume ratio. Question six, I am not clear about the assignment questions. Uh, what are the unifying principles that decide how birds deal with extreme temperatures 
is this related to oh okay i cannot read the rest of this question because it unfortunately answers the assignment so uh, i mean it's it's not it doesn't necessarily answer the assignment but um, yes i would recommend watching my physiology lecture and then answering it accordingly i cannot give away the answer on a live interaction session that would make the assignment quite pointless number 7 please explain the organ nephrons in more detail nephrons are the filtration unit of the body so if you uh, your kidney is composed of a lot of these nephrons and each of these nephrons has liquids that go in and water is drawn out at some places solutes are drawn out or added in at others and as a result you get concentrated urine and that's true of birds it's true of mammals and um, also true of any other vertebrate that has kidneys and an excretory system so um, when that filtration fails you eventually end up with uh, accumulations of harmful compounds that can lead to kidney failures and uh, dialysis machines in that case do the work of the nephron for you question number 8 this is about birds of paradise why are only birds of indian ocean islands called birds of paradise peacock pheasants rollers are colorful some of them indulge in dances etc question mark uh, i'm sorry i don't understand the question but uh, there there are no birds of paradise in the indian ocean islands they're actually quite far away from the indian ocean and i'm not sure if you're asking me why peacock pheasants and rollers are colorful uh, if you are that is a question that is unanswerable in its event what are the mechanisms causing them to be colorful please refer to my lecture on color and that is all answered there uh number 9 a little detail is needed regarding eyes iris cause of colorations do they also take multiple hues like feathers yes they do i don't believe if i i am not sure if i covered that in my lecture but yes the irises are frequently pigmented with many different uh, pigments including carotenoids in some cases irises can be structurally colored because they have crystals that serve as diffraction gratings and scattered light and that's how you get blue eyes uh, eyes can be white because of depositions of terrin crystals that scatter all wavelengths equally so yes irises can be pigmented and also have a lot of coloration variability i thought i had mentioned this in the lecture but perhaps i did not uh, but really it's all the same as integumentary color or feather color the same principles operate some specialized pigments are only found in the iris but you know it's not the most important thing in the world almost all the male color birds are brightly colored during the breeding season what is the mechanism by which birds are able to change their colors reversibly i believe i answered this on the discussion forum um the exact mechanisms are not uh, not known perhaps but approximately what happens is that changes in photo period temperature etc etc cause molts um birds shed their feathers and grow new feathers and changes in gene expression patterns can drive new feather patterns now uh what cause what causes the cert certain kinds of colors to develop it could be dietary it could be structural it could be a lot of different things how do color abnormalities occur are they permanent uh, i'm not sure what you mean by a color abnormality uh, if you're referring to color variants uh, they are often permanent yes because they are genetic uh, how can we differentiate between different types of aberration again i'm not really sure what you're asking here um but if it has a color that is atypical that is not the standard color for a bird then you should just be able to quite easily tell them apart uh i don't unless you mean um what the mechanisms are that drive it and that and that depends on what color you're looking at and if you want to know what causes those colors again refer to my lecture can you comment on the feather coloring mechanism in breeding plumage again refer to my previous answer bird bills while one can understand that evolutionary changes happen due to varying habitats and food habits how does variation in water birds like storks open bills and spoon bills come about uh, i think you've answered your own question really uh, they're probably driven by diet but there are a lot of other factors that uh, drive changes in bird bills and if you want to know more pay attention to my research over the next few years and i'll tell you um then there's a section here called general questions so here do we want to go up which are about the assignment should i go through those or do we want to take other questions first uh the assignments are still open so i don't think you could discuss the assignments at the moment it's not questions about the assignments it's oh, like sorry. questions about issues uploading the assignment something something uh, 
Okay, no, that's not actually. The, those are meant to be asked on the discussion forum. Uh, maybe that's at what the I end, if there's, uh, if there's a bit of time, if we end early, maybe Devika can uh, address some of those questions. Yeah, okay. I think those, I mean, they're very, um, they're very like technical issue questions. Other than that, I think I am done with the questions that are asked on the doc. So what am I supposed to do now? Look at the Zoom chat. Okay. There's a number of questions there. Right. Oh, there's a lot. Uh, okay. I don't have to answer that. Uh, good evening. Okay. Something, something. Uh, latest theory on relation between enantiornithines and modern birds based on similarities in the skull structure. I think that question is for Jaipal. Uh, I can... <laughs> I can answer it, but uh, I, I, I would say it's not related to my, or, or is it related to my lecture? Did I talk about enantiornithines? I did talk about enantiornithines, but there are, um, there, yeah, I mean, there are, there are obvious relationships between enantiornithines and modern birds, but uh, whether they are direct ancestors of each other, I still, I think is still an open question. I don't think enantiornithines are the ancestors of modern birds. They're possibly likely something that share a common ancestor and that's about it. Are you guys presenting anything? Uh, no, I am not. Uh, can't see the video. There is an echo. Okay, that's not. Sorry, I'm reading out all of this chat, but there's a lot of chat. How do doves prepare crop milk? Uh, there are a bunch of secretions that get mixed with sort of pre-digested and mashed up food. And that seems to be what causes it. But there are also other things that I'll freely admit I don't know. So, but that's as far as I know about uh, crop milk. How can we differentiate between two male slash female of the same species? I'm not sure whether you mean uh, the male and the female of a species or two different individual male birds. Uh, I'm sure birds can tell individuals apart. We have a little more trouble than that. We usually have to rely on genetics or other. Banding is a nice way to tell them apart. You'll probably hear more about banding and other things further on in the course. Scavenging birds eat carrion dead mass, but still live longer. How? Uh, scavenging birds may not necessarily live longer. In fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, but if, if what you mean is that they eat dead rotting things and don't die or get sick as a result of it, we don't actually know, but it might have to do with extremely powerful stomach acids. Uh, but that is a very interesting question. Be interesting to know whether... Um, uh, birds that eat rotting meat have a higher tolerance to getting bacterial infections or whether it's just their stomach acid. How do birds build endurance and muscle? Well, build endurance, I'm not sure of, but if you mean build up muscles the same way that we do, through eating proteins, depositing them in your muscles and regular exercise. Um, there are scientists and non-scientists in this course. I'm not a scientist. Um, uh, don't, uh, there is, there is no such thing as a question that does not add value. And there is no such, uh, there is no such thing as somebody trained in science. There are people who do science for a living and there are people who do other things for a living. And most of us give public lectures on a regular basis as well. So if we can't handle questions, uh, of a certain sort, then that's our problem, not yours. So if you have a question, you should definitely feel free to ask it. And please don't, please don't be afraid of uh, your question being silly. There are no silly, I mean, there aren't really silly questions, but there can be silly answers and that's my problem, not yours. Is it true that a bird can shut down their half brain and be half active? Uh, I've heard this a lot, but I'm not really sure whether they're actually shutting down half their brains. It does seem to be, uh, at least on seabirds, like floating around or gliding around in the sea or whatever, that um, it's not really shutting down half their brains, but uh, the sort of EEG patterns that we associate with sleep only come from one side of the brain and then from the other side of the brain, so that some part of the brain is usually still behaving like it would if they are awake. I hope that makes sense. Is there any way to segregate questions? Ah, why, why, why do that? I think we should all be a nice integrated class and do all that. Of course, this question is probably not directed to me. It's probably more directed to Devika and Suhail, but I'm answering it anyway, so I hope you don't mind. How do we get your lectures? Uh, that is a question I don't know, but I think <laughs> Devika may be able to answer that. Okay. Why do birds in Papua New Guinea and parts of Indonesia called birds of heaven? What are their parameters? Is it only their plumage or social mating rituals? Again, I think you mean birds of paradise. And 
it is not only their plumage or social mating rituals because other birds have those too. Uh, they're just called birds of paradise for a very simple reason, because the first specimens that came to Europe had no legs. And as a result, old European uh, kings and nobility all thought that they must be birds that flew in the heavens and therefore didn't need legs because they never perched. That is the origin of that name. And it is now given to a single family or a group of birds, which are still called birds of paradise. It has nothing to do with anything else. So it's a name that is kind of messy and um, uh, uh, pointless. Oh, thanks, Devika, for answering that question. Sorry, I'm going linearly. So uh, some of the questions may already have been answered. And then I would be uh, saying how to study and prepare for the exam. I think that is also for Devika. Um, there is a question here about the weekly assignment that is asking me to give you the answer. No, I will not give you the answer. Sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, the assignment is quite pointless. Is pigment deposition in the body? Why? I cannot tell you, but how? I can tell you, which is that they are transported to a certain area, usually in sort of micelles or liposome like structures because carotenoids if you remember are largely lipid soluble and these lipid soluble uh, carotenoids uh so hell am i still audible yes you are you froze for a minute okay. uh, a i got seconds. an alert saying your internet is unstable so you're, you're fine uh, yeah okay so uh you know they're lipid soluble and they're transported to certain areas and then there are specifications in those certain areas where they get expressed outward and that's why the face of the egyptian vulture is yellow but is the rest of the skin of the Egyptian vulture yellow? You probably there are probably other parts that are yellow. You just can't see them under the feathers. But um, in many other cases, yes, gene expression patterns dictate whether carotenoids are then incorporated into the feather germ and then pushed out into the feather. In that case, they are deposited on the skin rather than on feathers. Yes, that is true. Uh, in flamingos, some feathers are darker with more deposition than others. Why do you think that is? Probably genetic. Uh, but also has to do with how much red algae they've been eating that are sources of carotenoids. So the darker parts will probably still end up with some carotenoid, even if there's less in the diet, but they won't be have that nice little pink flush to the rest of them. Does that arrangement have any benefit ecologically or is that random? It isn't random. Does it have any benefit ecologically? Well, the presence of carotenoids is an indicator of a good immune system, typically, uh, because carotenoids are antioxidants and good immune modulators. And it is thought that by depositing them into their feathers, many birds, maybe not flamingos, but many birds are sending a signal that says, look, I've got so many carrot, so much carotenoid that I can put them in my feathers, which means I have a good immune system and therefore my offspring will have good immune systems. You'll hear a bit more about sexual selection, I think, going forward. Colors in birds help in mating behavior, blah, blah, blah. But what governs colorful birds as it is contrary to camouflage behavior? A trade-off, in fact, exactly between uh, showing off to members of your own species and getting eaten by somebody else. So you've sort of basically answered your own question, actually. Uh, you have explained that a factor with carotenoids is that they do not, uh, yes, so feathers are uniformly colored. Yeah, yeah, how can we explain the partly white and partly red colors in an adult? So you are mistaking a plumage for a feather. You may, the, the adult flamingo's plumage maybe many different colors as many other carotenoid colored birds, but individual feathers are one color. So that should answer that question. Uh, can you elaborate on the doubly labeled water, me water method? I really didn't grasp that. Okay, uh, doubly labeled water is, uh, well, I mean, the same thing you do when you put in tracers, right? It's just putting in any sort of tracer and then tracking where it shows up. So when you track where it shows up, you know exactly how much of it has been used and where it has gone. And that's, doubly labeled water. Uh, how do birds adapt to extreme temperature variations over the years versus when they arrive at their feeding grounds? Well, some birds have a very wide thermal neutral zone. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to express certain proteins or other things that make you more cold resistant. The third thing is to grow more insulation or less insulation, put on fat. Uh, there are many ways in which you can do that. What is it about some Niger, uh, this thing? Why are they specifically unable to do so? Because they can't find enough food to eat, basically. Uh, that's, uh, that's what usually sends birds into torpor. Um, and what is it about Niger's? Why is it specific to Niger's and hummingbirds? It just so happens to have evolved in those groups. Other bird species have other responses that they do. Many migrate, they move somewhere else, they go around looking for food. Yes, two different individual males. I think I answered that question. 
white coloration of egret due to less precursor from diet or some specific metabolism, probably a genetic uh, factor that doesn't deposit pigments in their plumage. They're just white. If desert birds have low metabolic rates as an adaptive mechanism, wouldn't it be beneficial for birds in other areas to do the same too? No, it would not. If they are in a cold area, they will freeze to death. Um, but remember, low and high are relative. Lower and higher, not necessarily one or the other. So low and high metabolic rates are um, relative. What's the difference between metabolism energy spent for foraging forest birds or pelagic ones that are spending days, months in flight at sea? Well, they're not necessarily close relatives, so you can't compare them like you would arithmetically speaking. If you wanted to make a comparison like that, you'd ideally want close relatives that have different lifestyles. And those, in those cases, the lifestyles, the differences are dictated by the energy demands of locomoting, finding food, the availability of food, and others. There's a whole section of things called optimal foraging theory or the min minimum value theorem that seek to explain these things. I don't know if that's going to be gone into in detail when they talk about uh, finding food, but um, uh, these are interesting things to read about because they're applications of economic theory to um, what birds do. Yes, we could take a few examples of common birds like purple rump sunbird or peafowls to explain different types of coloration, but I'm not sure uh, what it is you would want me to do. So yes, the iridescent colors of a purple rump sunbird are structural. The peafowl's neck is structural and so is the peafowl's tail. Uh, the yellow belly of a purple rump sunbird is a carotenoid, so I hope that helps. And the wings, those brown wings of a purple rump sunbird are melanin, most likely. And the scatterers in their feathers are also melanin. We know male birds are more colorful, not true, not in many birds actually, but there are exceptions. You mean where female birds have more colorful patterns than the males? Can that be explained on the basis of the lecture we had from you in color? No, it, ca it cannot. It can be explained by the, on the basis of sexual selection and others, which you will probably go into a bit further down the line. The mechanisms of the color are the same, no matter what. It is a feather and they are governed by simple chemical and physics principles. It doesn't uh, you're, you're going to a macro level that we haven't gotten to yet. What is the reason for sparrows not being seen these days? Uh, that is a question I don't think is for me. So do owls migrate long distances? Yes, they do. Snowy owls, look them up. Why do waders tuck their heads back during resting? Any particular phenomenon for this? It is thought to be to minimize heat loss by um, covering it with an insulating layer, but also because when they tuck their heads behind, they sort of form a ball-like structure, which has a lower surface, effectively lower surface area to volume ratio. Are common kites scavengers or preying birds? Mostly scavengers, but I'm pretty sure they can eat live prey on occasion. If I'm wrong, so Hale, please correct me. Do birds have different mechanisms to stay afloat in air? Yes, they do. Some glide, some flap. There are some hover. There are many ways to do things. Is it related to their size? Yes, it is. But more specifically, not just their size, but what you call the aspect ratio of their wings, which is the ratio of the length to the width, and also the wing loading, how much of their mass they have per unit area of the wings. That's just two parameters that govern it, but it also is governed by what they do with their wings, like hummingbirds, for instance. Yes, they have different anatomical adaptations also that uh, dictate how they fly. So hummingbirds and kites have very different types of wings for different kinds of flights. Are birds which are part of ecotone areas such as mangrove ecosystems considered as wetland birds? Uh, their diet mostly includes fishes, but they nest on land, so are they terrestrial? I think you are trying to put into categories what is a continuum, but uh, you know there are, there are birds that live in wetlands, there are birds that live in both wet and dry areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Kingfishers are traditionally wetland birds, but the white-throated kingfisher lives in some pretty dry places, so... Uh, I would know, but I'm also not sure if that question was for me. How long does a bird sleep during nighttime? Varies heavily depending on the bird and sometimes even closely related birds. There was a study on bar in South India that said that they sleep, uh, the two species of barbed sleep for very different durations. Is the resting time different in different birds? I think I just answered that. In which part of the body bird of the bird can we find semi-plume, contour, phyloplume, and bristle type feathers? Uh, I think that's going to be gone into in more detail later on when we talk about other aspects of plumage anatomy, but uh, I certainly don't know where you can find semi-plume type feathers, <laughs> so I'll let you know that.
कैन यू एक्सप्लेन ए टी पी प्लीज हाँ ए टी पी इज एडेनोसिन ट्राइफासफेट इट इज द एनर्जी प्रोड्यूसिंग यूनिट ऑफ मोस्ट सेल्स एंड हाइड्रोलिस ए टी पी uh meaning cutting off that phosphate one of those phosphate groups releases energy which is what we do to obtain most energy for most things we do egyptian vultures apply mud to look red are there any other birds that apply color like cosmetics well apply color i don't know but they also um they also uh do um you know they dust bathe and cover themselves in dust and other such things like that probably to get rid of parasites nobody is really 100% sure so do butterflies puddle on mud dung for the same reasons that egyptian vultures eat dung no they do not uh they do something quite different uh so go look that up because it's always fun to read new things why do bar headed geese fly at high altitudes during migration isn't it more energy consuming uh i don't think answering why uh, is possible uh the fact remains that they do and the reasons that they do so are probably ecological or governed by uh nutritional and other considerations as well as the likelihood of encountering predators at high altitudes that said those are speculations and not necessarily what is true <clears throat> i am rapidly going to run out of um, uh vocal cords to answer all these questions and so how to recognize when a bird is molting it will shed its feathers do birds produce afps like fishes living in extreme cold regions not to my knowledge because birds can regulate their temperatures unlike fish I'm sorry if this is very specific, but how do some swifts' physiologies allow them to sleep during flight? This I do not know, uh, so it's a quite answer you'll have to go look up yourself, uh, because I don't know anything about swift sleep. How to differentiate different stages of feathers such as natal plumage, juvenile plumage, and nuptial plumage? Uh, uh, use a field guide. Is that's what I do. It works pretty well. Uh, i'm sorry a lot of these questions are um i mean i'm not really sure how to answer them so i would like to know about examples of altruism and its evolutionary benefits in birds i don't think that question is for me so uh you may want to keep it around for later in the course is there any research that shows the correlation between insects included in the diet of birds and their coloration yes there is and also grain eating birds look up in particular a lot of work on house finches If we find a dead bird, how do we preserve their feathers for teaching students? Um, the feathers should be fine on their own, but again, I don't think that's a question for me. Where do gulls breed on land or trees? Um, on rocky islands and cliffs mostly, but again, I don't think that question is for me. How do beaks of birds get colors from pigment? Yes, from pigments, but they can also be structurally colored the same way that skin is, because it's the keratin that forms the outermost layer of skins that forms the keratinous sheath of the bill, and that's what's colored. but all the same ways can you please specify the name of the chemical that gives the parrot its green color there is no chemical that gives the parrot its green color the color is combinatorial there is a cytochalvin that colors the feather yellow and then a melanin scatterer that scatters light to make it look blue and the combination of the two gives it green the only bird that has a green pigment so far as is known is the turaco any bird in the indian subcontinent that you feel needs a lot more studying and observation pretty much every single bird that's found here in my opinion but uh, uh, i don't think that question is for me either dr krishnan okay that is directed at me uh, i read earlier that the body size of birds are shrinking with size with longer wings uh this is something that i am not very familiar with i think in some cases birds it's thought that birds are migrating longer distances because of changes in the climate and other things and that is causing changes in their uh, traits that help in migration but um i don't really uh know of a lot of literature that's shown that can conclusively and the physiological reasons for it are probably simply the demands of flight and the long term risks associated with it i don't know i guess it's hard to say can one compare torpor in birds and hibernation in mammals no because there is also torpor in mammals and hibernate there is different other thing it's a long term shutdown of things or are they separate mechanisms for different reasons that is correct uh, similar reasons not really different reasons but they are separate mechanisms uh, you may want to read uh, so if you can find animal physiology by nat schmidt nielsen it's a common college textbook that many people use um and it's not a very it's not an expensive book to buy so i thoroughly recommend it you can actually read an entire chapter on hibernation there it's really cool uh that's one of the reasons why i don't want to give away too much information here because i really think you guys 
it's it's good for everyone to start reading more of these more general books because they're um, I mean they help me a lot and they're really fun to read and you probably will find out a lot more learning by yourself than you will from any instructor. Are birds related to flying dinosaurs? Birds are flying dinosaurs, as many would say. Why are shorebirds, waterbirds mostly white or black in color? Again, the why is quite impossible to answer. Um, it's merely a pattern that there are. I don't think they are white or black in color. I think many of them are brown, black, white, et cetera, et cetera. And that's probably because they are all mostly melanin pigmented and don't really use a lot of keratinized or structural colors. Watch birds with their name. What are the ways to watch birds with their name? Again, I don't think that's a question for me. Color change in adult birds from juvenile stage. Uh, I've already answered that question. There is no blue color available in nature. There is no blue pigment available in nature or known in nature, I think is the better way of putting it. Nothing known yet, but clearly there are blue colors in nature or we wouldn't see anything that was blue. Uh, this is a Hindi question that I cannot, sorry, I reading Hindi written in English is always very difficult, but abandoned bird chicks ki dekhbal is not my purview on this. So I would suggest asking somebody else. Thank you, you're most welcome. I hope I answered them. Uh, can you put the book name here? Uh, I'll send it through your TA uh, and Jobin can remind me if I, if I forget. But I also think I put in the reading list. Uh, altruism, again, not my, uh, not my purview of things. So, um, you know, stay tuned and ask the people who talk about behavior when they teach it, because that's where altruism comes in. Uh, I do not really uh, discuss those in my lectures. My lectures are on very different things. So I would say, hold on to your hats and find out then. Whoa, 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 okay. Lots of questions all at once. If a bill of a bird is deformed, will it reform again? Depends on what is deformed. If it's only the outer sheets, then it can grow it back. If it's the bone, then it cannot. The tail is simply a series of feathers. It can shed the feathers and regrow them. Uh, kind of birds miss a few flight feathers. What do you mean by miss a few flight feathers? I do not, I do not understand. Uh, miss a few, if you mean birds occasionally lose their flight feathers, yes, they do, and then they grow them back. Okay, I don't know if there are going to be any more questions. Huh, you're welcome. I, I, I suspect I will have lost my voice by tomorrow, but I'm glad I did. This was fun. I'm sorry. There Thanks, are some... sir, Anand. Maybe there sure. might be a couple. Sorry? I was going to say, maybe there are a couple more questions in a, in a minute, but I just wanted to uh, uh, remind everybody that uh, <laughs> the live sessions that we have are about the current week's uh, uh, lectures. So in, in this case, for week number two, it's Anand's lecture, uh, lectures on anatomy, physiology, and color. Uh, and even though you would have received potentially the lectures for next week, uh, which are lectures by uh, Moshmi Ghosh and uh, Manjari Jain, uh, this interaction is not about that. They will be here to interact with you uh, next uh, Friday, I'm guessing. So the end of next week. So right now, Anand, I think there's a, a mishmash of questions. Yes. Uh, and some of which are really anticipating what's going to come later in the course. That's and what I, think, I thought too. So okay. that's why I'm sort of punting them where <clears throat> exactly something happens. But yes. I just yes. hope nobody minds waiting another week for them to be answered. I thought as yes. much, but uh, yeah. All right, I have a few more questions now. And, uh, huh, sorry. No, no go. And I just wanted to remind everybody that even if they miss uh, asking you a question now. They can always uh, do so in the discussion forum. Yes. And uh, you'll come back and answer them later. It can be weeks I later. I will well. do so that. That's, uh, yeah. yeah, I will do that. Uh, so someone is asking me to elaborate on my research works regarding morphology analyses and museum specimens. Like, do general any trends uh, arise over collecting specimens over more than hundreds of years? Well, not hundreds, a hundred or 150 years. And yes, in some cases they do. There was a study at some point that found that Hawaiian honey creepers' bills had gotten shorter over a certain hundred year time span, time span as their um, host flowers went extinct and they switched to something else. And um, the, uh, there's also uh, trends in genetic diversity and other things that happen as a result of population decline. I suppose you'll have lectures on conservation at some point. So you'll hear a lot more about that then. Uh, you're almost welcome. 
and uh, in birds especially the breast stomach fellers of light colored birds one may see that the inner portion is black while the outer color towards the tip is paler or lighter is this for insulation not necessarily for insulation it may be that they are also for ab resistance to abrasion because melanin does that and this sort of thing can only happen with melanin pigmentation yeah but there are also thermal benefits to having melanin in your feathers so how to study birds and the subject well this is what this course is about do we know why sexual dimorphism is seen in only in certain species and not in others why i don't know again why is not an answerable question but uh, it is presumably related to plume uh, to to aspects such as sexual selection and other aspects of behavior which we'll hear about very soon and it may also be related to things like parental care and the need for camouflage and other there are many such ecological factors that govern it Yeah, now I'm just waiting, I guess, unless Jobin's gotten more questions. Here we go. Do exotic birds like sunbirds adapt to our climate? Uh, well, sunbirds are not exotic. They are quite native, actually. And many are growing any particular adaptation in their body, metabolism, temperature, or we have to provide it artificially always. Uh, I would say absolutely not. Or most sunbirds are quite native here, and we don't have to provide artificial nutrition to any of them. So unless I misunderstand your question, but uh, sunbirds are quite native to here, so they are not exotic. If you mean in general introduced species, some of them will adapt, some of them will not, some of them will establish, some of them will not, and that depends on their diet and various other factors that are available to them. Uh, this most recent question, I do not think is something that is directed at me. I think you should probably post that on the discussion forum. Taylor birds are colorful. Is it feathers or body color? It is feathers. Can one bird species derive pigments from both carotenoids and melanins? Yes, they can. See sunbirds, for, it, for example. Some birds, sunbirds have carotenoids, melanin, and structural colors all at once. So uh, in the case of Taylor birds, it is probably mostly melanin. Colorful feet, the same way that I mentioned in my lecture, uh, that would be carotenoids and other things getting into their feet and their skin, because skin can be colored the same way as a feather can. Oh, not at all. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what egg syndrome is. So, and uh, also, I don't think it's necessarily directed to me or about this lecture. Where do magpie robins habitate? Everywhere where they can find suitable insect prey, gardens, parks, open country, forest edges, sometimes within forests. Again, but I'm not sure that that question is directed to me. How exactly do cold, does cold blood exchange in a counter current? Quite simple. You have uh, cold blood flowing in one direction and warm blood flowing in another. And uh, what happens as a result is that blood, uh, that heat always flows from warm to cold, right? And when warm blood reaches the feet, uh, it, uh, the heat travels to the cold blood flowing in the other direction and goes back into the body. So if you have warm blood going this way, the other option is that all the heat goes out in the atmosphere like here. But what happens is because you've got a heat gradient, heat goes this way and comes back in. And that means that you don't shunt as much heat out into the atmosphere. And that's good. Um, again, that is not a question that is relevant. Uh, um, okay, thank you about the Karina, but I'm not sure that that's a question yet. Uh, where can I get the lectures? I believe Devika already answered that question. Um, Pigeons don't really ruminate. Ruminate is a very different phenomenon. Pigeons have a crop where the food is ground up by grit, which is very different from a ruminant. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, pigeons don't necessarily eat rapidly. I mean, all birds eat at a certain speed, 
and i would say many human beings eat pretty rapidly too myself included uh, my guess would be that many birds eat in short rapid bursts partly because they're also keeping an eye out for potential predators which is a highly edible so and that is sort of be one of the reasons why we'll look up after every time they eat something but i'm never sure whether that's actually been systematically tested uh there's a question about the paradise flycatcher and black nape monarch aren't classified in flycatcher family the reason being morphology and phylogenetic studies but i believe that is a question for jaipal not for me and uh how can we observe birds habitat selection behavior again you may want to um phrase that to the relevant instructor on that part of the course won't the counter current heat exchanger predispose the bird to frostbite in its feet or extremities no not really because it's happening at the extremities so when it's happening right there it's not really going to cause frostbite right because the heat is actually staying within the toe now if all the heat went out into the atmosphere that's when you get frostbite but when you have a counter current heat exchanger you're actually keeping all the heat within you here and sending it back in and it's constant it's not like it's happening in packets or in quanta it's happening constantly and as a result you stay at a certain temperature but that is an inter- that is a nice question i i do like that is there relation to egg colors with the habitat birds live is, lives in or anything else what defines the egg color well eggs are also pigmented so pigments are sort of splattered onto the eggshell uh, by special cell or cells when it is being formed and eggshells can also be structurally colored and everything else because it's just a calcium carbonate deposition on top of an egg uh, relations of egg colors with the habitat the bird lives in i don't know if that's entirely an answered question yet but there are people working on it so there may be an answer very soon um again the question jobin just posted is answered by devika so yeah mobbing behavior mobbing behavior again pay attention to next week's lecture uh and ask i think you want to ask that question to manjuri is sexual dimorphism seen in all bird species of the same family or is this not necessarily true not necessarily true why most wetland birds are brightly colored unlike forest birds actually some might argue it's the other way around uh i don't know if uh, brightly colored but uh i i did already answer that question a uh, question about wetland bird colors but that is not necessarily true because wetland birds can come from many different families and uh ducks are pretty brightly colored Uh, and also pretty drably colored so i think it depends on the species and the circumstance uh, under under study in that particular circumstance uh while you get more questions anand should i quickly answer the most common questions i've been getting sure yeah so where do you find uh, dr anand's lectures they're all put up on the nptel platform and they're also there on youtube so all you have to do is uh, find the nptel channel and go to the playlist which says uh, basic course in ornithology so that is where you find all lectures uh, of the course then uh, how to submit assignment uh, this current assignment week to assignment uh, many people have asked this so you can upload a word file uh, to the place that is provided on your nptel dashboard so you just have to go and explore the dashboard a bit more uh, it clearly says upload a word file or a pdf is also fine someone has said that they've uh, someone has asked if a screenshot will be um checked and uh, well preferably please don't send a screenshot but in case uh, there's no other way by which you can do it we will check it yeah i guess these were all the questions that were for me so anand i think there's another question for you yes cular fluttering is found in all birds not all birds but many what is the common method most birds use to reduce heat loss uh, go somewhere where it's warm and avoid large temperature gradients that is the most common method most organisms and even inanimate objects uh, uh, can avoid heat loss by so that's what that's what they do birds are not vastly different from mammals that way slightly higher metabolic rates and body temperatures on average but that's about it is 
Is there a time by which we have to stop this or uh, do we just keep going on and on and on? Uh, yeah. So we usually stop at five, but if uh, there are no more questions coming, then we can end it. Yeah, I mean, I think there is something coming. Jobin just posted yeah. 1700. Yeah, which is five o'clock. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right. You're welcome. Um, I hope I didn't miss anybody's questions, but there were a lot of messages. If I did, please put them on the discussion board and I will answer them when I can. And if your students are interested in anatomy or physiology, that's 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 really nice as well. Um, there are concepts that are quite easy to explain, actually, even at a school level. Uh, if you eliminate a couple of bits of the more jar like slightly jargony terminology that I used, so um, uh, I definitely think they're interesting ways to talk to school kids. And in the era of three D printing, who knows? Maybe one day we'll be able to ship three D printed replicas of birds in all over the all over the country someday nocturnal birds vision mechanism uh, they have large eyes that capture a lot of light and they have more rods than cones and as a result they can capture lots of light that's about the most common adaptation you'll find in nocturnal birds uh, olfactory sensing in birds um uh, it's the most common birds where olfaction has been studied, and most birds have an olfactory system. It's a bit reduced compared to the optic lobes. But um, tube nose petrels and cathartic vultures have high, large, very uh, nostrils with great exposed surface areas and very sensitive olfactory systems. And they can detect uh, odor trails from miles and miles away and follow them to a source in much the same way that moths follow pheromones or flower odors. So, yeah. You're welcome again. What are the heart rates of say a hummingbird versus say an ostrich? Much higher. But uh, you also, in, in quantitative terms, you would normalize these to body size and carry out those comparisons. And that in that theory, everything is trying to stay within the same range of metabolic heat production. But if you lose heat faster, you must produce heat faster and so on and so forth. But hummingbirds have very high heart rates. Do all birds take mud baths? No, they, all birds do not, but some birds do. And what determines it? I don't know. Um, torpor during migration, hummingbirds do, bar-headed geese do not. Why would some owlets like a collared owlet have a face like plumage on the back of their heads if they are the top predators in the food chain? Uh, there's a lot of assumptions there, unfortunately. Uh, what the top predator in a food chain is, is not always known. Uh, why is unfortunately not really answerable. The function of a face-like plumage on the back of their head, it's not really clear. But yeah, there are probably things that can eat a collar out of it. It's not a very big bird. Are carotenoids only made using photosynthesis? They are not made using photosynthesis. They carry out in plants photosynthetic functions. Birds can live without food for how many days? Depends on the bird. Uh, a hummingbird a few hours, other birds much longer. It all depends on metabolic rate. Any other beetles other than domestids which helps in studying bird anatomy? No, not mostly domestids are what people use because you want something that eats carrion. I mean, you can't just put any other random beetle in there, otherwise what will they do? Why are male birds more colorful than females? Not That is not true. And uh, 
in 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 a large number of cases and i also answered this question a bit earlier so please refer to that answer we discussed this exact thing i think about a half an hour ago in this that again with the number of questions there are i'm not i'm not really keeping track of time all that well <clears throat> I think maybe having cups of tea at these discussion sessions would be nice. It's a pity we're not doing these courses in person. But someday, uh, kindly provide notes. Uh, can't avail to download. I think that would be a question that's more directed to Devika, not to me. Uh, and in fact, I believe that is being done. Can you comment on avian endocrine system and function? Well, nothing much more than what's already in the lecture. Uh, they have an endocrine system just like we do. They use hormones for a lot of different things just like we do. Testosterone governs a lot of changes in plumage and um, changes in uh, the breeding cycles and birds use es uh, es estradiol and other hormones just the same way that we do. Testosterone actually has an odd other effect in birds, which is it can stimulate neurogenesis because birds actually undergo adult neurogenesis to produce the song producing areas of their brain. And you'll hear more about that further down the course. Manjali is going to talk about it, I believe. Also, you could look up the works of Peter Marler and John Wingfield and many others on avian endocrinology and song. They've done a lot of really, really nice work that you might find really cool. And it's also uh, when read pretty accessible to a school, to a high school level, if you're a high, if you teach high school. So length of neck of birds in different habitats. I don't know whether those necessarily correlate. Some birds have long necks, some birds have virtually no necks, but almost all birds have a flexible articulation somewhere in the neck. And so they're not as stiff necked as we are. Someone once asked me whether birds with long necks get vertigo. I said, that is a question that you'd have to ask the bird. I can't answer it. I assume you were asking about whether habitat correlates with the length of neck because that wasn't really phrased as a question, but anyway. How is sleep controlled in birds? The same way as it's controlled in the rest of us by the brain. But um, yeah. Uh, what is the reason for the different colors of the eggshell? I answered this question a little while back, so please refer to that. Gut microbiota of birds. Do carnivorous birds and herbivorous birds have different microbes in their guts? Yes, they do. Stay tuned for more. Lots of people working on it right now. Uh, uh, some birds that eat plant material have specialized gut microbiota that help them break it down. Uh, and unless I'm much mistaken, honey guides, for instance, have specialized uh, lipid digesting microbiota that allow them to digest we uh, beeswax. So yeah. Why did birds lose teeth? Another question that is quite unanswerable because it starts with why. There is no why to these questions, they just did. And they got along fine and so they survived. Why questions in biology are largely unanswerable even though a lot of people uh, do ask why sort of colloquially, I don't, uh, um, most of these questions do not have a cause and effect. So outside of, um, outside of, folk discussions, they are unfortunately not scientifically answerable. Hello, and welcome to you. It's nice to see someone from Sri Lanka. I have actually been to Sri Lanka and I really enjoyed myself. So I look forward to the day when I can go back there again.
Oh, that's nice to hear. And I hope you're hope you're enjoying yourself. You're welcome. I hope I was of some help. Yes, please go ahead. I think we'll ask your question as the last one because it is five o'clock. So, um, you know, as soon as as soon as we're done with yours, I guess we sign out. So, please go ahead and ask. You're welcome again. Balancing organs in birds are the same as the balancing organs for us, vestibular systems. Jobin, maybe lay off the questions from YouTube right now because uh, I'll just answer the last question in chat and then we'll sign out. So. Oh, well, that question is one for Devika, but uh, Dev, and you know, please refer that question uh, about certificates to Devika. She can answer that question. In fact, I believe she has on the discussion board. So please refer to that, and you'll be able to find you'll be able to find uh, the answers there. No, no, no problem at all. All right. Uh, so I think that was the last question, Devika. So. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Anand. It's uh, past five, so I think we'll wind up. Sure. And, um, yeah, so we'll meet again uh, for the interactive session, live interactive session on next Friday at 4 p.m. All right. Where and... we'll talk to uh, Dr. Manjari Jain and Dr. Moshmi Ghosh. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Okay. Thanks, Devika. And thanks, if Suhail's around, thanks to him as well. And thanks so much, Jobin, for putting all those questions in the chat. So see you guys around.